that's the first thing that I look at with our clients is what are the things that needs to be happening even without you there? Um, that's kind of the first thing of like how we make sure there's a match. The second thing is I ask them if uh, if we could wave a, wave a magic wand and have your perfect executive assistant with you, they've been working with you for six months to a year, what would they be like? Because like aside from hard skills, I put in a lot of value on soft skills of like high management, due diligence, being able to uh, grow on their own or or knowing that Google slash chat GPT is their best friend. So it's it's it has to be both sides of like what is their pain and also what needs to be uh it's not just putting a band-aid on it but like making sure that the person that they work with actually helps them kind of get better and better uh what it is that they do Welcome and good day, everyone. Today, we have a very, very special guest. We have Miss Leanne Lai Lakaba. This is season eight. I'm sorry, episode eight of season 14. Today, we'll be discussing, you can view it so many ways. It can be an opportunity to start your own business, maybe even sharpen your own skills as a recruiter, or even sharpen your own skills as a virtual assistant. Our topic is about hiring virtual assistants, and we've asked Leanne to come and join us to discuss her experiences as she journeyed to this very, uh, very same process. Leanne? Hey, Paul. Good to be here. Um, should I basically just dive in, or do you want me to tell a little bit more of my story? Oh, please. Tell us more of your story. All right. So I uh, started working online as, actually, as a freelancer, as a, a freelance writer when I was 15 years old. It was one of those things where it was a, bo a bored 15-year-old uh, because that was still pre uh, K to 12 in the Philippines. So I was uh, about to go into college uh, and I found basically my first client basically making blogs online. And I did that for a few years. Uh, I did graphics, I did video editing, and then I stumbled into being a virtual assistant as well for a little bit until I got a uh, job for a U.S. publishing company as one of the editors. A year later, I became CEO of that publishing company because I basically just rose up um, and was willing to be trained. And then a few years later, I started my current agency, uh, 2XU, which is a virtual assistant agency, uh, now going four years, actually, next month. Wow. Four years. That's quite cool. That's quite good. Maybe you can also explain to us a little bit, because when you say virtual assistant, for me, it's one of those terms is very, very broad. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's not really specific. Maybe tell us a little more about uh, the, maybe the world of virtual assistants. For sure. So virtual assistant, um, I always describe it as if for anyone who has watched the Devil Wears Prada movie of like basically you're the, the executive assistant right outside the oh. front door of uh, an executive's office. So that's usually how um, is the easiest way for me to explain what a virtual assistant does. So they do that, but it's all the way across the sea. So um, almost everything and anything, either you know they're doing email management, calendar management, you know managing social media, managing content. Um, it could be that they're doing a lot of the work for um, as I always use my own assistant example of like to helping me take care of our clients, responding to them when they need um, a few things, responding to them as me. Uh, there's also where she helps me manage my YouTube channel, my TikTok as well from time to time. Uh, so it's it's very much is a broad uh, blanket term because under virtual assistant, there's admin virtual assistant, social media assistant, there's a lead generation assistant for sales. So customer service assistant. So it really depends on the kind of person that you need, but virtual assistant very much is just a blanket term for it until you get more into the specifics, basically. Okay. So if I understand correctly, if I wanted to become a virtual assistant, usually I start as a generalist mm -hmm. and then I, I go into something maybe more specific, like like maybe uh, setting up leads for sales or anything like that. Okay, excellent. Thank you for that description. Now, in your journey, can maybe you can talk about the journey of actually starting your own business, the struggles you faced, typically with virtual assistants, especially with Benoist, if you want to say. 
Mm. Uh, you know, ghosting and, you know, the guy who shows up just for one or two days and then disappears on the client, you know, that kind of thing. Maybe you could tell us a little more about those kind of struggles that you had. For sure. So when I started uh, to exude, it was twenty nine. it was late 2019. So it was like six months before the pandemic. Uh, so when we got our first client, hired her first assistant in February of 2020, um, because we basically kind of the same way that you described it a little bit of like the first person that we hired oh, they have now um, family priority, so they won't be able to proceed with the job. And the second person I think we hired for that same client um, was got pregnant and then had to be on bed rest, basically, and couldn't work anymore. So it was kind of that start, start kind of feeling when we when to first started. Um, but then since then, we've gotten like referrals, we've gotten... Um, for us at you I wanted to make a point where we were already established as a Philippine corporation even before I started the business. So we would have all of the benefits, the you know, the HMO, all of that good stuff. So then we would take care of our people in the best way. Um, and it has been a lot of trial and error of figuring out like what the clients actually wanted, what they needed, um, what they needed to know to work best with their with their assistant. Um, and a lot of our focus really has been on what is a bottleneck that this isn't doing and how can we make that easier for them for the next person um so then the client knows better basically for the next one so it's very much um more va centric versus like our, our client centric just because we know when we can support the ea the best then we know we can support that client the best as well um and then um the other thing that you mentioned was the uh basically just, yeah the struggles of of um hiring recruiting basically generally in, in the Philippines a lot of it hasn't been as bad I've only experienced so far I've only experienced like the ghosting um twice I think in the last four years which is a good good number I know people have, have had more than that um and most of it is just kind of really showing up with a little bit of a balance of professionalism and also empathy because we know what our people go through like the family things the culture differences uh, but also keeping in mind that um we had an agreed upon um, thing of what what's going to happen, what's going to be expected. So it's been that balance of the both uh, for sure. Okay, so if I understand correctly, you you are more let's say employee focused rather than mm -hmm. customer focused. Uh, you know that's very interesting because when you talk about customer experience, I saw a beautiful caption. I forgot who said it. I'm not just brilliant enough to come up with it, but they said. They said that customer experience will never exceed employee experience, and I thought, oh, that's a, that, that's a that's a good thing to point out. Okay, and I'm glad that you've recognized this and how important it is to drive some of your some of your outcomes, if you want to say. Now, you mentioned some two some two things that you maybe struggled with. You talked about uh, identifying and aligning the needs of your client, the CEO. Uh, how do you work with that? How do you determine? Uh, that the clients, what the clients needs, and how do you get a best match, if you want to say? Or so is that a secret? <laughs> I, not really that secret because I, I talk about it on my YouTube channel all the time. So the biggest one is uh, whatever it comes to, basically for lack of a better term, diagnosing our clients on the kind of assistant that they need is there's two different exercises I run them through. The first one is I have them walk me through their surgeon story. So what that is, I explain it basically of like, imagine you are an expert surgeon and you are because for our clients, they have an expertise that they deliver, whether they're a coach, mm -hmm. an author, they run programs, basically when them, they, they show up, that's kind of their going into the operation room. But there's always things that needs to get done before basically getting to the operation room and after they go through the operation room. So um, as a uh, example I always use is before I hop on a sales call with a potential client, my assistant has already done their research, has already filtered them, uh, has given, has prepped me basically for um, the results for the scorecard that they went through, um, you know, where they from, you know, uh, what time zones am I supposed to be keeping in mind of? And then after I do the sales call where I'm able to show up, she does the follow-up calls. She, uh, not the follow-up calls, but follow-up emails, sends the assets, all the, all that good stuff. So that's the first thing that I look up with our clients is what are the things that needs to be happening even without you there? Um, that's kind of the first thing of like how we make sure there's a match. The second thing is I ask them if, uh, 
if you could wave a, wave a magic wand and have your perfect executive assistant with you, they've been working with you for six months to a year, what would they be like? Because like, aside from hard skills, I put in a lot of value on soft skills of like high management, due diligence, being able to uh, grow on their own or or knowing that Google slash chat GPT is their best friend. So it's it's it has to be both sides of like, what is their pain? And also what needs to be, uh, it's not just putting a bandaid on it, but like making sure that the person that they work with actually helps them kind of get better and better at what it is that they do. Can you share maybe some examples of some, maybe what you would call challenging clients to work with? Like let's say, yeah, what's the name? Meryl Streep was the devil kind of deal. <laughs> okay, all right. I uh, Maybe you could talk about, uh, just share one or two uh situations maybe and discuss how you overcame them um for some of them honestly the the more and i've i've shared this insight with a lot of other people as well is a sadly not a, not really a stigma but a belief that most foreigners or most of our clients have, have still have is that oh you're charging that much oh i'm just looking for you know a a, a cheap virtual system that i can just hire to do this one thing um and I found that really hard because even if they do start working with us, they're still a little bit penny pinching. They're still making sure that they're getting every every penny back for the for how much they pay us. But it's it makes the value of what we're doing a little bit smaller because they're doing that. Um, so it hurts a lot of uh, it's hurt, it hurts us in a lot of different ways because they're still assuming that this when we've been giving value in a different level, basically. Um, right. That's kind of one. Um, a second one is uh, clients basically who um, just basically forget sometimes that their EA is human. Um, I, I think oh. that's the one. <laughs> it's like they're a little assume that they, their VA can just do it like that. They forget that they have family, they have a life. So they just assume that they're just a faceless person across the screen. Um, so we have to be, we, we take in a lot of the time to educate basic air clients of like, hey, keep this in mind. That's why I also keep that, uh, you know, bring up the soft skills part for them because there's a personality type. They're the kind of, what the kind of person do you like working with? So it's mm -hmm. uh, a double-edged balance, basically, of, again, that professionalism and empathy, um, both sides of balancing that with both the clients and with the uh, virtual assistants. Well, it's funny because I teach a lot of, uh, leadership courses and when I work with uh, when I work with managers especially the middle managers or even the people just moving into management you know I ask them uh, do you remember everything you've signed <laughs> most of them say no mm -hmm. I said exactly so your boss he won't remember everything he signed so he'll forget that he just go yeah but to, to yeah, tell them yeah. if you're giving you too much work, remind them, hey, boss, you gave me this yes last week. I said, you know, I can only do so much. Okay, excellent. That, that's, a, that's a great example that you have there. But you also mentioned the word bottleneck. So typically, where would you find the bottleneck in the in this process of hiring a virtual assistant? Uh, the biggest high, uh, bottleneck that I always see is um, when you don't know what you want, that's like that's kind of the, a funny thing because like for oh. us at Twix, you we do so much to diagnose what kind of assistant that they need. But we've had clients before where we show them like a list from their original list. We show them like, hey, these are the potential applicants for you. When they come back to us, like, oh, I actually need this kind of person, or I um, uh, this is enough shift that I need this kind of person. So then it's hard for uh, it becomes kind of an easy mismatch, uh, because mm -hmm. they weren't able to be clear enough or aware enough, of course, um, and most clients of ours, we, we um, it's easy to forgive because it's their first time hiring an assistant, but they uh, just that of like not really knowing what they want makes it a little bit harder for us to hire because we'll keep giving them like 10 applicants or 15 applicants to review. Um, but if they're not sure themselves of who it is that they want, it's going to be harder for us to match them at all. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's actually quite common. Because even me, same thing. I mean, not with a virtual assistant, but so many times I get a request, hey, Paul, can you do problem solving and decision making? I said, sure, let me talk to you first. And then I talk to the manager and then I ask him, I'll just ask you a couple of questions first. I said, look, the person you're speaking about who needs the training, does he? is it that he really doesn't know what to do? Is he afraid to do it? Or does he think it's not his job? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, among the three, it's rarely the first one. 
it's always yeah. one or two or three. I said, if it's two or three, that's not problem solving and decision making. I need to train you to be a better manager. <laughs> okay. Prepare better for the next one. Yeah. Yeah, and I just I just let it go because said, they'll be wasting their money, and I tell them straight out because they're just wasting your money. You're gonna do that course, but yes, that that does happen quite often. That uh, even the client is not sure, and usually the more grateful clients are the ones who, who who you've helped to realize what it is they want. Oh yeah. Okay, they 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 become the very grateful ones. Now, if we look at virtual assistant. How do you see the future of the virtual assistant market? Is it growing? Is it uh, there's some pain points if you want to say? Oh, it's definitely growing, and it'll it'll keep continuing. Just because, as, as I mentioned, like virtual assistant is such a blanket uh, job position, job description. Um, it can continue being morphing out. Like there's there's now, of course, with the rise of AI and chat GPT, like prompt engineering assistants, um, people who can who can be uh who've mastered basically how to use prompts with chat GPT or with mid-journey or the all of the other tools. Um, there's also going to be basically anything that's new, anything that's coming up, um, having a kind of a basic a specialist virtual assistant come in and be able to figure it out, find that out, make it make it through the process and systematize it. Um, that's kind of going to be just the evolution of the virtual assistant role as it is. Um, okay. Just because as long as their business is growing, they will need an assistant at one point. Um, and uh, a natural um, growth, basically, that I've seen a lot of our clients go through is they'll hire an assistant. That assistant becomes specialized on one area of their business. Usually it's marketing. Then so they need a second assistant. Um, to basically catch all of the other admin work that wasn't uh, taken care of anymore, that becomes an admin assistant. And then now there's a need a third assistant. So it's kind of a ever evolving role just because of uh, basically just how fast businesses can sometimes grow in this day and age and also um, the number of businesses that are getting started. How do you prepare for that, this ever evolving and maybe speed? Actually, it's more of the speed that's the issue because all businesses evolve anyway. Mm -hmm. It's more a matter of speed at which things are happening. How how do you handle this? How do you prepare for this? So a lot of it is we put a lot of importance when we do our monthly check-ins with our clients, because when we do our monthly check-ins with our clients, we're able to uh, anticipate what's some com upcoming for the next quarter. Like we ask them like, okay, so for example, we're now going to Q4. So when we're doing all of these calls with our clients, we're asking like, hey, you know, um, what's what's coming up for you guys for this next quarter? Um, so then we're breaking it down to, okay, so monthly, what would that look like for the EA? So that way for us, as we're planning out the training for the EA next couple of months, we're able to plot out and be able to give them the upskilling that they need to be able to prep basically for as their company grows to make sure that they grow as well. Okay, that's that's very much a, a process-related uh, situation. How about more on the uh, soft skills? Are there any soft skills that you have to maybe strengthen, even among the VAs or the potential mm -hmm. VAs, uh, as this whole situation of, you know, you can call it disruption. I think that's the term that they like to use. <laughs> okay, yeah. and Disruption is happening. It's very happy, happening very rapidly. And a lot of companies struggle with it. Okay. Um, mm. So you're on your end, how do you, how do you, well, you explained how you deal with, dealt with it in a process point of view. But in terms of a soft skills point of view, how do you deal with it? And uh, more importantly, at least from what you see, how are some of your clients handling the situation? For how I'm handling like a lot of it um, on the on the soft skills side, uh, it boils down to re really self management. Like I I and I teach this a lot of our assistants as well of like um, you have to take care of yourself first um, and make sure that you are able to give rather than burning yourself out and overwhelming yourself. So when it comes to growth in any case, in any training that I give, um, I always tell them to never pour from an empty cup or you can't ever pour from an empty cup. So you have to take care of yourself. Um, and when it comes to our clients, I kind of say the same thing of like, um, you know, you if you don't know what you're working on, it's going to be hard for you to delegate to your assistant. So having that self-management is key that I've seen so many times in the last um, decade of working from home. Um, that helps someone when it comes to the shift, the changes of growing and having a business. Okay, excellent. That's a, that's a point that sometimes is overlooked. Mm -hmm. Okay, we ourselves, we don't take care of ourselves. When I used to do training, for me, the biggest issue, at least for, uh, for how do you call in-person 
work. <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. There's just lack of sleep. Everybody wasn't sleeping yeah. enough. I said, my goodness. I said, please. <laughs> you know what I mean? If you can't even sleep enough, there's no way you can do this, this, or this. So exactly. uh, but that that is quite a struggle in itself. Uh, how about how about uh, for your company? You what are your plans for the future? Um, so for two weeks, you I definitely want to scale it to a certain point, and I've I've been working on it basically the whole twenty twenty three. I've been kind of uh, firing myself from different positions that I that a usual uh, founder goes into of like, oh, I've now fired myself from marketing. I fired myself from from managing our VAs uh, because the next steps for me is to start like. Um, basically mini companies to attach to 2XU like one of my uh, favorite ones that I really want to do is creating like a content ma- uh, marketing agency creating a bookkeeping agency so things that will then still still to the core of like supporting our executive assistants so whenever a client say like hey uh, uh, do you know anyone who can do like the the bookkeeping part like oh actually we, we have you know 2XU as a bookkeeping agency here so that's kind of my empire plans for 2XU <laughs> well, it's always good to have such plans, uh, especially the bookkeeping. And uh, well, yeah, the, you know, those are the things that many companies usually outsource. If you want to mm-hmm. say, it's that kind of work that, that that you're looking at. And currently, your market is basically what in the U.S. or do you have other markets outside the U.S.? So it's mostly been uh, Australia because it's just easier for Australia, us okay. time zone wise. But right. we also have clients from the UK, from Dubai, and uh, like you said, from the US as well. Oh, all right, that's nice. Uh, do you see any expansion anywhere else in other in other areas geographically? Um, we never know. Like that's that's kind of the the fun thing. Music like for the other clients we've gotten, we didn't even know that we could service people from you know the Europe or the UK. Uh, so I don't really have a specific target. Is is uh for us, it's building like I said that their EAs and as well as building relationship with the clients, and then they refer um the most amazing people to us. So then we keep on growing. Oh, well, that's nice. Referrals are always the best. You don't need much marketing if your referrals are strong. <laughs> I like that. Uh, how about you on a personal level? Uh, of course, you, you want to grow your uh, 2XU empire, if you want to say, which is an mm-hmm. excellent thing. Uh, how about yourself? How do you, other than 2XU, uh, it's not that I'm interviewing you now. Uh, well, how about you? What's what's in your future? I was about to ask, what, what do you imagine five years from now? That's a typical interview question. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, for myself, my biggest goal in life is to um eventually start a business in new york um i know it's like so many people are like oh why do you want to go there it's like for me like it's ever since i was 15 years old i've always wanted to go there so it's still in the uh-huh. back of my head always uh like i i'm i keep telling people i just need a reason to go there i just need like someone to invite me to speak to an event or something um and then I'm, I'm on the next plane there um so it, it that's definitely my own goal and of course like the other side of it is uh i do want to live in japan for a little bit to live in different places for like at least a year or so um just to try to keep exploring the whole rest of the world oh that's nice that's really really nice it's uh that kind of uh, outlook especially will, will always allow you to keep you growing and learning if you want to say Now, uh, just uh, maybe one uh, last question. Among your virtual assistants, what do you think is their biggest hurdle that they have to overcome to become an effective virtual assistant? Parts of it, the one of the biggest hurdle is that you do have to be very much uh, proactive or um, for lack of a better term as well as like, it, not really because it goes hand in hand being proactive and taking initiative because for a lot of the time um like i mentioned like some clients of, our, of ours have never had an assistant before so for them they're kind of also like figuring this out as they go and if you want to be a really effective virtual assistant the combination of taking initiative so like taking things forward or being proactive of like seeing like oh that, that's you know for example uh that one a uh, column doesn't have this one important calculation or formula in it, I should probably just like go ahead and change it or update it. Doing those little things helps make it where then for the client, they can start trusting you. And it's usually that trust part that 
uh, unlocks everything else in the business. Like once once a client fully starts trusting their their assistant, it's going to be easy for them to delegate. It's going to be easier for them to find other work that the assistant can do. It's going to be easier for them to want to keep growing with the assistant. Um, so that combination of learning how to be proactive and taking initiative um, will take them so far because that's kind of what I see is like most assistants will just accept what the client said, like will accept what the client wants them to do. Just kind of, I've heard different clients said this, of like, oh, I've hired Filipinos before. They've kind of mostly been yes men. Um, but it's with that uh, that pro- proactivity and, and uh, taking initiative that leads to curiosity, that leads to things happening. Again, the main thing is that leads the client to trust their assistant a little bit more. So then they can expand and grow within the business. Okay, excellent. That's a that's a very good point that you're making. Uh, sometimes it's a cultural issue, especially for us uh, Pinoy's. If you want to say, we do tend to just say yes because we're afraid of getting the boss angry for whatever reason it might be. Now, just one last question: If I were to want to start my own virtual assistant agency, what are the steps that I should take? First one, and this is the biggest one that made it everything else easier for me when I started, is know who you're targeting. Like that, that, and it's the same thing that I advise to people who want to become virtual assistants is know who uh, your niche or your industry is, because then it's going to be so easy to know what it is that they need. Like for uh, when two weeks we started, I just came from that book publishing company. So I started targeting authors um, because for me, I know the, the pressures that they're in. I understand basically the process of getting their book published. So it's easy for me to start getting them in because I could diagnose them. I'm like, oh, so you need your assistant to do X. You know, X, Y, and Z. So depending on who you are and what it is that you want to do as a virtual assistant, focus really on who it is that you want to work with because then everything else becomes a little bit easier on building systems and processes around it because, again, you know what your nature that industry goes through. Hmm. Okay, all right. So be clear on, on who your target market is if you want to say. Actually, that's a, that's a common thread among other businesses. Be clear about who you're targeting. Uh, because it does get a little confusing if you're not. Yep. Okay. Now, uh, before we uh, wrap up, are there any events or talks that you will be giving that you'd like to invite our audience to? And more importantly, uh, where can our audience reach you? Um, so events that I do have coming up right now, um, funny enough, it's become quiet. It was really, it was really almost back to back speeches in, in, uh, the first half of, uh, the third quarter. All right. Um, uh, I think the next one that I have is uh, I'm doing a workshop in Bohol on how, uh, how to become a virtual assistant, the different types of virtual nice. assistant. Um, and I think I'm going to have another event. It hasn't been fully confirmed yet. So I don't think I can name it yet, uh, where I'll be doing a like uh, talk in, uh, same thing in Bohol end of November. Uh, and then I just have a couple that I'll, I'll always sprinkle because like at, at any time, like I'll have schools reach out or other places want to have me as a speaker. Um, and as well as where to find me is I'm probably the most reachable on LinkedIn, just just my name, Leanne Laila Kaba. Uh, and of course, I have a lot of content on my YouTube channel on how to become a virtual assistant and how to hire a virtual assistant as well. Same thing, just my name. Are you from Bohol? No, I'm actually originally from Tacloban, living in Cebu, but I keep getting invited to like different places. Uh, it just <laughs> so happens that the events have been in Bohol the last couple of times. I was in Tacloban just a few days ago. It's a it's a very uh, it's a very tidy place, surprisingly. Mm-hmm. I mean, I didn't see, I didn't see any litter on the street, not one. I said I was really surprised, especially <laughs> living in Manila and everything else. <laughs> yeah, but uh, you know, the end. It's been a Great for us. It's a wonderful half hour that we've had together. And I, I think you're very, you come across as very inspiring. Okay. To those who either want to be a virtual assistant or you want to start their own, their own business as a virtual assistant. And for all our viewers, if you really, really enjoyed uh, what we shared, please don't forget to click on the like and subscribe buttons at the bottom. And our next speaker is Rosana Leonardo, whose topic is bringing out the best in others. All right. And as always, remember that learning uh, is a never-ending journey with limitless vistas.